Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I, it's, it's funny. I, some of you know me. Uh, where, I don't know. It, so teaching is something that has been growing in me. It's something I'm developing. And I feel like every speaker kind of learns their, their flavor, their tendencies, how they like to communicate, what they like to talk about. I'm learning about myself. I'm just a glutton for punishment. I think I tend to dive into really difficult, controversial things, and I love just to like poke around in there and try and figure out. I love cracking a difficult puzzle. Um, so today we're going to be talking about may dip a toe into some controversial waters here. But when it comes to controversial hot topics, I think the only way to talk about them is imperfectly. And because they are controversial, it's impossible to say anything without upsetting somebody. So assume that somebody today will be upset, I'm, I'm sorry, right off the bat. If I offend you, I apologize. But what's important, as we'll learn today, is being able to have grace for the things that upset us or that might rub us the wrong way. Because if we can have those conversations, there's probably something that we desperately need hiding in there. And there's just this dragon of controversy trying to protect it. And we have to be willing to face it in order to find what's on the other side. So I ask for grace today. And... I think the more adventurous of you are probably stoked to say, ooh, this sounds like a juicy one. And it is. Uh, so I want to start with a couple fun things. Uh, I want to talk about my wife and I, because we're great. I love her. I love our marriage. It's one of my favorite ones. Uh, Natalie and I are different people. I mean, how many people are different than their spouse? Any married people? Any, can you think of any differences between you and your spouse? A couple? So Natalie and I have some of those. Natalie was reminding me as I was thinking about like Nat, like when was the time that when was like the last time like we disagreed on something that like I thought was a good idea that you didn't, and uh, I remember a time or Natalie reminded me of a time where I I said hey you know what uh, I think we should sell our house, like I think we've actually put a ton of value into the house we've probably grown its value by like ten or twenty percent. The market's at a high. We can sell it, kind of collect on that, reinvest it into a new property. We'll have more space for the kids. Maybe I can have an office. You know, there's a lot of really good things that would happen. On paper, the math, it all checks out. That's a good decision. It's objectively a great decision, and you cannot tell me otherwise. <laughs> you already know that there's a joke coming. <laughs> And Natalie said, that sounds like a great idea. You're right. The math does check out. However, let me remind you of one thing. We're having twins in two weeks. We're going we're to be giving birth to two new babies, and we have a one-and-a-half-year-old in two weeks. Do you think now is the best time to do that? And I go, ah. Oh. Suddenly, my certainty fades away as a new perspective brings a healthy dose of wisdom. That's nice. Then I think about other ways that were different. I thought about last time we were on vacation in South Carolina, there was a rock, a big old rock next to a big old cliff with a bunch of water under that. Anyone knows that scene? And I said, Natalie, I want to jump off a cliff. And Natalie says, like most of you might, don't do that. Don't jump off a cliff. Why would, they, why would you think that that's a good idea? And that's where I said, I'm going to do it. So despite that, those differences, because is it wise not to jump off a cliff? Yes. Is it wise to jump off a cliff? Sometimes. <laughs> I will argue. Because as I stood up there, me and John, actually, John Barlow back here, we were standing up there at the top of the cliff off about a 30-foot drop, which is about, I don't know, at least double this, plus a half maybe. And we're looking down off the ledge and go, we're going to die. Let's do it. So we run and we jump as you're falling through the air. Like, it's funny because before you leap, the only thought in your head is, if I jump, I will die. But then you push past it. You're flying through the air. It's a magical, exhilarating experience. And then you hit the water, and you live. And you think about, like, well, what makes that a good idea? We found courage that day. John and I became men that day. That was a, there's something to be said about bravery, about taking risks, about seeing what you can do. Like, is there wisdom in that? But yeah, it's scary, and it's safer not to jump. But sometimes you just got to jump. So there's two very different perspectives that are both wise, reasonable, be, like opinions that you can back up that have a lot of wisdom in there. Scripturally, you can find backings for both of those examples. And uh, so, I, uh, and there was another example too. This is now different. Back when I used to be a general manager of our family business, uh, I learned a lot in that position because I, it was the first time I had to keep a team together. I had all these different people, a staff, and it was my job to make sure we all worked together to accomplish a goal. 
So uh, we were talking about it. We had this idea for a new product. We're like, this would be amazing. And we can get the branding done, and we can sell it like this. And then this kind of client would buy it. It'd be really cool. We could do new designs and new characters and everything. Blah, blah, blah. And we were all getting all excited about it, talking it up. And then our quiet, kind of like very kind of cautious uh, 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 administrator at the time was sitting in the corner, and we're sitting there being like, this is all amazing. What do you think about it, Darlene? And we all look over her, and she's like, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> and we go, what? Like, I, what a buzzkill. I'm like, Darlene, we just talked about all these great things that are going to happen. Why wouldn't we do this? Like, why you got to be such a downer? You're taking the wind out of our sails. And then she kind of like spoke, then she thought for a second, she said, okay, well, here's the deal. The where, from where I'm sitting and what I'm seeing, we don't have the financial capital to be able to back something like this. We're going to overextend ourselves. And even if we do sell 100% of the first run, that's going to pull away from sales somewhere else. And she explained like nine amazing reasons why we should not do the thing we're all excited to do. And then I paused for a second, and there was kind of like a chilled quiet in the room as we all thought, she's right. <laughs> all of us, she's definitely right. And at that point, I realized there's tremendous value, tremendous value in the views and perspectives of people that are different than ourselves. And I thought, what would we do without Darlene? Without her, you know, some might say, oh, you're being a buzzkill. You're, you're, you're holding us back. You know, you're not letting us fly or do these big, great things. But some of us might say, she's keeping you from running right off a cliff, not over water, over a big old stony Grand Canyon. That is going to be bad. And if it were not for Darlene, we would have ruined ourselves. So I want to talk about a concept here because in, the, in both of those situations, there is tension, right? There's this idea of like, ah, Darlene, like, we want to go this way, but you want to go this way, and here we are now with our tug of war, and we're both pulling on this thing, trying to move, the, move the, the flag in either direction. And we're both pulling on that thing, so what we're talking about here is tension. So I want to think about uh, a couple different concepts, and, and actually, uh, where to begin? Let's talk about uh, story. So another, another uh, way to talk about tension is, is conflict, right? There's a conflict there. I want something, you want something, we're pulling at each other, and now there's tension in our tug of war rope. So think about a story without conflict, all right? If there's no tension in a story, then what do we have? So think about this. Simba wanted to rule the Pride Lands one day, so he did. <laughs> Where's the story? <laughs> Roll credits. What did, what did we just watch right there? Batman wanted to keep crime out of Gotham City, but there wasn't any. No end of story. There's, no, there's nothing to do. There's no challenge. There's no tension. And uh, the Avengers wanted to save the world, but no one was attacking it, so they went and got tacos instead. <laughs> the end. What's the story? There's nothing in there. And then I, I have a couple images that I want to show. Let's talk it out, out of the story context. Let's go into the visual context. So I want to put up a picture first, and you could say that uh, all, all, everything that we see is the contrast between light and dark, right? There's the dark stuff and the light stuff, and everything in between that makes up all the other shades of gray, all the other colors. So let's, let's take a photo, but we're only allowed to use light, no darkness at all. What do we think of our photo? We can't, you know, no, this isn't working. Something's wrong about this. Let's try, let's try it the other way around. Let's do a photo, but we're only allowed to use darkness. Let's see what we can take. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful, I really admire this. Now let's see what happens if we can find an interplay between the two. A little bit of light, a little bit of dark. What kind of things can we get? Okay, now we see something. Something was built. We see sky, we see water, we see man-made bridges. This is beautiful. What else can we see? God's creation, animals lapping water out of a pool. It's gorgeous, it's, it's unique, it, it evokes emotion. Let's see what else we can see. We can see the Monopoly guy. Time has not been kind to him. <laughs> But the only way we can see the Monopoly guy is because there is both light and dark, right? There's a, it forms a contrast, and the only way we can see the beauty of Mr. Monopoly is by mixing light and dark together and seeing how they play around with each other. And then let's talk about another idea. Let's talk about music. But since I'm only a little good at music, and Kenny's a lot of good at music, I'm going to have Kenny talk about this idea for a second. And we're talking again about tension. Kenny, how does tension play into music? Yeah, so I just want to play a little example for you. Um, give me one second while I get set up. OK, so how many of you guys have heard of the band The Beatles? Yeah. OK. The, the Bugs? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The Bothers. The, the uh, Bugs or the musicians? The, the, the musicians. Okay. Um, 
So uh, first of all, let's let's uh, let's do a little song similar to the light and darkness, the the picture thing, right? So if we just have one chord, that's a C chord, and I just played the C chord. A story has what a beginning, a middle, and an end. So three. Let's let's play the three chords, uh, the C chord three times. Beginning, middle, end. Great song, right? It really <laughs> really uh, really moved me, but. But then, you know, we take, uh, we add a little tension to it. We get, you know, that went somewhere. All of a sudden, we have, we have a direction. We have a flow. We have, we have a little bit of emotion and quite a bit of tension between those two notes, those two notes. And it really wants to resolve out to, and all of a sudden, we have resolution. We have something yes. that, that resolves. So, um, just, just a quick. Th- this is. I, I won't play a lot of it because Danny's got a lot to get to. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but just, just the beginning of the song. Hey Jude, don't make it bad. Take a sad song and make it better. So even that much, we have quite a bit of tension on that word sad. Take a sad song. Make it resolve. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but we have we have a, a story there, right? So all music is made up of tension and resolution. Mm. There we have it. Thank you, Kenny. Let's give him a hand. I have one more example for you. What about the instrument itself? Not about the writing of a song, but just the instrument. So I lied to you when I said I was only a little good at music. I'm amazing. I'm not gonna brag, but I am. When I was eight years old. <laughs> When I was eight years old, I took guitar lessons from the legendary Christian rock guitarist Becca Barlow before I ever knew the Barlow family. So uh, so here's the deal. I'm going to play something she taught me on a guitar with no tension. There is no music here. This is garbage. There is no tension, right? It's only when the strings are tuned, pulled, perfectly taut at the just the right note, tension that creates the music. So what are we starting to see here? I think we're seeing a pattern. Without the tension between light versus dark, there's no beauty, there's no image, there's nothing to see. Without the dance between tension and resolution in music, there is no music. There's nothing interesting to listen to. Without the tension between the hero and adversity, there's no story. There's no nothing. So I think about, you know, let's even break that down even further. We have music. That music as a concept is a play between tension and resolution. Depends on tension. The instruments that play the music depend on tension. And the instruments themselves are made up of molecular little atoms. And an atom is proton, neutron, electron, positive and negative. Tension. Perpetually in a state of tension. The building block of all matter. And somebody out there thinking about leptons and gluons. Let's not even get into that. We're going to stick with the atom. Uh, Because, okay, there's smaller units now. But they make up the protons and the electrons that create the polarity. So the polarity there, positive and negative, perpetually in tension. Like they want nothing to do with each other, yet they're still a part of the same thing, the atom. Uh, So today when we talk about this polarity, I kind of wanted to title the message. I want to talk about polar unity. The idea that we can be polar opposites, but still be a part of the same unit. So you think about the atom, right? Polar opposites that are still united. As God made the first man, he made him out of atoms. Positive and negative little but Maybe that's why he called him Adam. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? I was advised by multiple people not to make that joke, but I, could, <laughs> I couldn't help it. <laughs> so... With Adam and Eve, right right there from the beginning, you think they're in the garden, they're in paradise. There is no tension. Everything is happily ever after, just one C chord over and over and over again. There's no conflict. There's no story. Where does the story begin in Genesis? In the beginning, in the beginning right? But then but where does the story get good? The serpent, right? We have an adversary. The hero has something he has to face. Suddenly there's tension in the garden. Adam and Eve never thought about disobeying God because they never had another choice, right? There was no other option but to obey God in the garden he created. They couldn't go anywhere else. They couldn't do anything else. They never thought about sin. They were never tempted because everything was just good all the time. All the needs were met. There was no story. It was just happily ever after. You know, it's just that perpetually infinite, 
Everything after conflict was just happy. So they were doing that on the front end of things. And the story gets good. The story really, I'd say, begins with the serpent. Let's say this. The story of man begins with the serpent. So uh, the serpent comes in and says, hey, I know that God said one thing, but I'm going to offer you another idea, another perspective, right? All of a sudden, the snake introduces tension, right? There is now tension. Now, you didn't even know there was another choice, but it turns out there is. And here's the deal. If you didn't know that there was another choice, you wouldn't be choosing. If you didn't know what it meant to fail, then you wouldn't recognize when you succeeded. Because even if Adam and Eve were living a perfect life, they wouldn't know it because, like, perfect life compared to what? What's the difference? You know, they, they would be perfect people and have no idea that they were perfect. If there was never a threat of falling into the darkness, there would be no real drive or passion or reward in pursuing the light. So all of a sudden here, we find this tension, and also without any becoming, there would just be being. And it's in the becoming that we usually find most of our meaning. So as this is all happening, there is this tension, and that is where our story begins. Now, you could say that this pull between good and bad, there's objective good, there's objective bad, and you could say, wouldn't it be great if all the bad was just gone from the world? But again, we come back to that problem of if all the bad is gone from the world, then what's the point of there being goodness? And if God created us as his children, if he was going to create children that have a will, a mind, emotions, that can make their own choices, if God wants us to choose him, we have to have the choice. So the serpents there in the garden and presented, people with, presented man with his first choice, man and woman. And it's in that choice that they now had the choice to either choose God or to choose their own way. And that is where the story begins, as far as I'm concerned. So here's the thing, though. If God made it, God made choice, God made tension, then it must be good, right? There must be something good in it. You know, like, if God made it, it must be good. But tension feels tense. That's where feelings get hurt. It's where people get angry. That's how relationships fall apart. There's just too much tension. Nobody likes living in a state of tension. It's uncomfortable. So how is it a good thing? Well, let's talk about a couple classic polar differences that are both necessary. For instance, husband and wife. Those are two different units that are so independently necessary, and either one of them struggles desperately without the other. And I think about that primarily in terms of like comfort and discipline. You know, here we are with children now, and we've been walking that line quite a bit. And naturally, Natalie leans more towards the comfort side of things. When Avery is upset, Natalie might lean, to, or when she's misbehaving, Natalie might lead towards comfort, and I might lead towards discipline. Instead of saying, oh, let's just hold her until she's okay again, I might say, let's teach her and strengthen her to overcome this. Now, which one of those is good? Which one of those is love? Both are. Both of them are right, yet somehow opposed. Because neither one can, like, you can't be, like, it's hard to be disciplining and comforting. It's kind of like a, you know, they don't, they're not the same thing. They're different, but they're still a part of the same unit. So if God is our comforter, we know that that's true because he said that about himself. But he also said he disciplines those he loves. Two sides, same coin, both necessary. A well-adjusted child is going to need both things at different times in different quantities depending on the child. Some kids respond a lot better to comfort. Some kids will not change unless there is discipline. And it's different for every kid. We hear that over and over again. Of parents with multiple kids, it's like the game changes entirely because that balance between, that tension between comfort and discipline must be adjusted based on the kid, based on the, the, uh, the, that specific circumstance and what's going on. And we actually, this, this whole message actually began with a word that we gave for David and Carly Slager. Uh, they're online. Hi, guys. Thanks for tuning in. So we were, they were doing, uh, they were dedicating their child. And, and I, I just, as we were praying for them, God gave me the word saying, hey, you're both different. And at times, you're going to feel tension between the two of you. Like you, won't, you think one thing is right and you think something else is right and it's going to be pulling apart for each other. And that's going to feel like tension. But God showed me in that time that, like, I see you both holding the corners of a safety net. And the only way that safety net can actually catch your kid is if you're both maintaining tension. Because if either of you aren't holding that, that safety net, it's just laying there on the ground. Or if you're both pulling too hard and it snaps, that's no good either. But there has to be a healthy, respectful tension between the two to keep the net taut. And that is where the safety lies for your kid. And I thought, wow, that's really smart. That must be God, because I didn't think of that. Uh, and that rabbit trailed down into this whole message. So let's, let's dig a little bit deeper into this one. How about the perpetual infinite conflict between the heart and the mind? 
Like, I, I will say about myself, I'm a five on the Enneagram, if that means anything to anybody, but I am like 90% thinker, 10% feeler. So if I approach a problem, I will almost never say, what feels right to me? I'll always say, like, let me analyze this, rotate this around, deconstruct a couple different algorithms, and then we're going to find the right answer. Like, that is absolutely how I prefer to tackle problems. But I also know people, too, who just, like, look at a problem and they just, like, take a minute, breathe, listen to their heart, and then nail it. It's like, well, you didn't, need, you didn't have to do any work for that. Like, you know, you just, like, you just felt it? What is that? Like, you know, like, that's like cheating. I don't, I'm, like, mad about that. But sometimes the heart knows things before the brain does. If only we knew how to connect to it and listen to it. Uh, but then at the same time, too, the mind calculates and plans and strategizes and it builds and it learns. So it's like, which one is right? Should we listen to our head or should we listen to our heart? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, we should listen to both. The, big, the biggest journey and struggle of my life and my own personal development as an individual has been learning how to let my heart have a voice. And I remember there being a day where I was just thinking and thinking and thinking, and uh, we were going to a pre-marriage program, and the guy, the guy leading it said, listen to your heart, ask your heart what it needs. So I paused the podcast, and I said, okay, heart, what do you need? And I didn't hear anything. I said, this is dumb. Hit, the pod hit, play, hit play on the podcast. He said, some of you may not have heard anything. And I went, oh, no, he's listening. <laughs> he's, he hears me. So then I paused it again. He said, if your heart isn't speaking anything to you, ask your heart, why won't you speak to me? Why aren't you speaking? And I thought, okay, pause the podcast. Heart, why aren't you speaking? And then I heard something immediately. My own heart, right in here, told my head, because I don't trust you. What? <laughs> that was like a scary realization. I'm like, my own heart inside my chest does not trust my brain. Because he says, every time I tell you what I need, you shut it down. So I just stop talking. Because you don't listen to me. And it's bringing me to tears now. I'm like getting choked up. Because that is still perpetually a tension that I live in. Where I have to remind myself. My brain is, we were talking at camping the other day. Uh, that I pictured my, I, pic, I picture myself, oh, you already, <laughs> can't, you can't prepare it, man. Uh, John, nice work. So this is me in a nutshell. I have this big, strong brain that I'm super proud of, and then I have this tiny, adorable little heart that's just getting yanked around by the big brain and never really gets to lead, but it's also a perfect picture of parenting, too, because a lot of times I'll be sitting there with Avery trying to tell her what to do or get something done, but when I just, like, sit down, you know, Crisscross applesauce in the ground, and I say, Avery, what do you want to do? I have more fun than I have in, in, in a month when I actually let Avery lead because she's only driven by her heart. There's no head getting in the way. So there's a beautiful tension there between the head and the heart that, that matters because our brain matters and our heart matters, and they have to know how to speak to each other and work together. Because if you only listen to your heart, it's, you're not, probably not going to get a whole lot done. You're going to have kind of an aimless life of passion with no real structure. And, 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 uh, and it'll be fun, but, you know, uh, you might not ever build anything or do anything or work together or, or fulfill your calling. You might just be constantly doing whatever your heart wants, which has its benefits, but it has its downside as well. And the brain, too. You might live a very successful and unfulfilling life if you're only listening to your brain. You make all the right choices, do all the smart things, and have no fun. Both are possible, but when they work together, we find that healthy medium. We find that tension. There's story. There's beauty there. Um, how about work versus rest? That's kind of an easy transition into that one. Do I need to work in my life in order to prosper, or do I need to rest and trust God to make me prosper? Which one is right? Both, right? If I never actually get out in the field and work the plow, then the field's not going to plow itself. But if I never take a minute to rest, I'm going to work myself to death. Or if I think it all depends on me, then I'm going to have so much anxiety and I'm going to work tirelessly and there's going to be no joy in my life. That's a problem too. So, you know, it, I need to work faithfully and vigorously in order to express my gifts and build heaven. But I also have to take time to rest and understand my value apart from what I can accomplish. So I heard a beautiful story about this. There was a man, a high-level uh, businessman who's running a, a massive company. So many problems, so many challenges. I, I never know what to do. I, I'm just so worried. What if we don't hit this deadline? This guy just got fired. That's messing up a bunch of problems for us. And he was so, he was so like stressed out all the time. He could never sleep. 
So as he was always in the state of like, I, can't, I just can't sleep, he, said, he had a crazy idea. He called somebody in Australia, you know, or I guess he probably looked it up online, found someone, and hired somebody on the other side of the world to say, hey, while I'm sleeping, your job is before I go to bed, I'm going to tell you everything that I'm worried about. And then while I'm sleeping, it's your job for eight hours of my sleep to worry about everything while I'm sleeping. <laughs> and you might think, well, that sounds kind of silly, right? But he'd go to bed and he'd say, hey, okay, here's what I'm worried about. Deadlines, we need a new marketing campaign for this guy. Our president's transitioning out. We don't have someone else on the other side of it. Uh, there's a new competitor that's really taking things out for us. So worry about that for me. I'm going to go to bed. Click. And they went to sleep. And I don't think I can think of a better picture of casting our cares on the Lord than that. Is when we say, I worked as hard as I can. I'm working faithfully. I'm using my gifts. I'm strategizing. I'm, I'm putting in effort to try and build something to glorify you. But when it's time to go to bed, I say, okay, God, I'm still worried. There's still stuff to do. I still got a lot going on. But I'm going to hand it over to you now because you don't sleep. You know more about this stuff than I do. So I'm going to cast all my worries onto you. You, you take care of them. I'm going to go rest now. And God says, absolutely. I will worry about these problems. You go and rest. Because again, if we don't rest, we burn out. And then we're no good to anybody. If we, if, we, if we burn the candle all the way down, there's nothing left of it. And we never work. We never build anything. We never express our gifts. We never grow. Both matter, work and rest. And it is in the tension between the two where we will be the most fruitful. So now we're getting into the fun stuff, right? I told you it'd be juicy. We're getting juicy up here now. So... <laughs> Calvinism versus Arminianism, right? This, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. So, again, I am not a theological expert. I am not going to break down the fundamental tenets of all of these, and I'm not going to prove that one is right or wrong. Even if one of them is right or wrong, here's what I want to talk about. One of the best conversations that I ever heard, the best teachings I ever heard about Calvinism and Arminianism, and just to break it down quickly, Calvinism is, is uh, the theology where God is wholly sovereign. Like, everything. Like, that's, that's where you're getting, like, predestination about, like, only, nothing happens unless God says so. Like, that is just, it's that sovereignty creates everything. So if, if God doesn't do it, it doesn't happen. It's kind of the idea behind that one. And then you have Arminianism that's saying we are co-heirs with Christ. We are someone who, you know, we are, we partner with God to build heaven on earth in a more active way. And there's things of, you know, in the Calvinism side, they might say that those who are, going to be saved are already saved in God's mind. So whether we go out and evangelize or not, doesn't matter. They're already saved if God wants them saved. So we don't actually need you. You just have to pray and worship God. So it's like, okay, well, that kind of takes a little bit of steam out of evangelism. If God's going to do it with or without me, then I guess just do it without me because <laughs> apparently I'm not needed. So it's like, well, there's a question. There's a little bit of a challenge in that theology. But then on the other hand, the Calvinists, if you truly believe that the only way anything is going to happen in the earth is if God does it, you pray like it is your life depends on it. Because no matter what you can do, the only way that I know that this world is going to change is if God does it, and all I can do is pray and worship it. There's a sense of like the grandness and greatness of God wrapped up in that theology. And you say, well, there's, there's definitely cons, but there's kind of some pros too. But you say, but I, I'm not really decided. You look over at Armenianism, you look at the same way. Well, we're co-heirs with Christ. The only way that the world's going to change is if through us, God within us, we partner with him and we go out and build it and we go out and seek and save the lost because God can't do it without us. Then you say, okay, well now I have to evangelize because if I sit still, nobody's gonna get saved and I have to be active, I have to get out there. Now it's like, okay, now evangelism is paramount in this other theology, but then you think about worship too of like, well, we're praising a God that you know we're partnering with him, but we're like half the equation. So he's not like, that great because he couldn't do anything without us. So in some ways, some people criticize Armenianism for saying, your God is smaller as an Armenian. So you look at that and you say, hmm, well, that's an interesting debate. And now I can't even stand up here and tell you that I can say with certainty which one is true. I will tell you that I lean towards Armenianism. I like to think that God works with us and through us and that he wants to grow us as we partner with him in the gospel. But at the same time, I can look at the other side and say, but there's still value in what you're bringing to the table. Maybe it's incomplete, and maybe it's not a matter of we should all be one or all be the other, but maybe we should live in this tension between the two. The teaching that I heard about it, the one thing that I took away with it that has stuck with me for, I think, almost a decade at this point, he said, I want to pray 
and I want to worship like a Calvinist, but I want to build and evangelize like an Armenian. Well, that's interesting. So are you saying that you can be both at the same time? Maybe not necessarily. Are you saying that, you know, we should all be one or all the other? Like, I don't think that's true either. I think there's this, there's this tension between is God sovereign or is God a partner with us? Like, I think he's kind of both, but depending on the circumstance, and maybe it's a bit of each, and, it, and there's, there's where we get to the tension. Some of you right now may be even thinking like, Danny, you're in the weeds now, man. You're in the thick of it. You're in dangerous territory. This is the tension. This is it. This is where it's uncomfortable. This is where we don't have all the answers, where we have to partner together and think about things that are uncomfortable or that challenge us. But as we discuss them, maybe we find something that's better than what our individuals held. Maybe, you know, husband is good and wife is good, but husband and wife is even better. What if we actually teamed up? What if we respected the differences and in that tension we found something greater than either of us had as individuals? That's what I want to talk about. Let's talk about, yeah, let's get even thicker into this thing. Let's talk about politics. Yeah, right? Don't talk about theology or politics. Those are the rules. I'm talking about both today. So so here's what I want to talk about. When America is founded, there was the two-party system. There was the right and the left. There was the liberal and the conservative. And you might say, well, that's ridiculous. Why didn't you just pick one or the other? And it's interesting because in any kind of monarchy or dictatorship, other forms of government, there's usually one person with one opinion that calls all the shots. Now, what did we just learn? We have husband and wife. They're good on their own, but when they work together, there's something significantly greater. So when we have the right, if if conservatives alone ran the world, I don't think that would be good for the world. I don't think that would be good for America. Even though I agree with a lot of things on the conservative side, if only liberals ran the world, I don't think that would be good for the world, even though I agree with a lot of things that they're talking about. And there's, but I think there's somewhere in the middle that is actually the most fruitful place. So you think about immigration. Is it good that people can come to America and build a life for themselves here? Yes, that is a good thing. Is it important that we protect our country from people that want to come in and destroy the country? Yes, that is important. So how do we do both at the same time? Well, again, one without the other is a problem. We can't let everybody in but we also can't keep everybody out, so then what's the answer? We have to work together in that tension. There has to be one side saying, I want people to come here, they need to come here, that's good, that's true, that's right. And I say, I know that that's true and that's good and that's right, but you know what else is good and true and right? Is that we have to be safe, we have to protect people. Yes, both of those things matter, let's fight about it until we can find a middle ground where we can safely satisfy both sides of the party. And I think that's, it will, so let's go on a little bit more. What about welfare? What about people who are just down and out? They are out. They are bankrupt. They have nothing. They need help. They need someone to come along and lift them up. They need assistance to get back on their feet. But on the same time, should we give that to everybody and forever? No, that's not good either. Sooner or later, if we never teach people to stand on their own feet, then they never do. A lot of people will just stay in this victim state forever. But are people really victims sometimes? Yes. So which one is right? Do we have welfare or do we have no welfare? Both. At some point, we need to find the healthy tension of who really does need to be lifted up and who really does need to be taught to stand on their own feet. It is in the tension that we're going to find the right answer. Let's look even farther. What about climate right now? Is our world suffering because man is causing issues in the world? We are taking things from nature. That is true. That is actually happening. But is it going to bring about the end of the world in the next three years? I don't think so. I think that's exaggerating a little bit. But somewhere in the middle of how do we protect the earth without destroying mankind in the name of protecting the earth? There's got to be a middle ground. There has to be this tension between the two. And it's uncomfortable. It means there's going to be debates. There's going to be fights. We're all going to get really emotional about it. And we're all going to say, no, you can't because my side is true. It's right. It's good. And the other side's saying the exact same thing. That's where we run into that tension. And now you think about this. What is, what if we just can't do it? What if we just can't, I cannot share space with you. I know we're supposed to both pull on this. We're both supposed to participate. We're both supposed to to take what we believe to be true and we're supposed to fight for it in the tension. We're supposed to have conflict. We're supposed to discuss it and be uncomfortable about it. So what if we just can't do it? Say, I'm out. I won't do it. I cannot do it. I will not get in, engage in this tension with you. I won't. Then I have two other options that matter today, if we can't share the same space, then I either have to convert you, which means you have to become exactly like me, or 
I have to destroy you. Because we can't share, there's, this town ain't big enough for the two of us, right? There's that standoff, and we're at guns, like only one, we cannot share this town, so we're going to have to fight to the death until only one of us can have the space. And then the conflict is over. You say, isn't that resolution? Maybe, but I would say that is a tragic resolution. So you think about the problem now, if we can't share space, what happens next? Well, let's think about what last happened too. What happened when Hitler couldn't share space with the Jews? We cannot coexist here, so you have to be destroyed. And since the more powerful one wins, we know how that story played out. What happens when North Korea couldn't coexist with South Korea? We cut the whole country in half because I, we cannot share it, so we're just going to push you all out. We're going to force you out, and we're going to take what we have. What happens when American colonists and Native Americans couldn't share space? War, death, destruction, disease. I have to fight and kill you because if we can't share, then I have to push you out, destroy you. And since I, you're not considering coming around to my side, I just have to push you out or destroy you entirely. Now, this is the problem. Well, let me just say one more thing. Let's go back to that polarity idea, right? The atom, negative, positive, proton, neutrons. We're going around, atom, tiny, microscopic. But what happens if you split that atom? If you break the unity between the positive and the negative? You say you're both different, but now you are separated. Anyone know what happens when you separate an atom? You get an atomic bomb nuclear explosion, the kind of explosion that can destroy entire cities and entire civilizations. So you think about, okay, well, it's hard to stay together, but let's not forget the cost of coming apart because that's going to be greater. What happens in a divorce? You have two units. You've come together. Marriage is saying that this bond here is going to connect us. We are opposites maybe, but we are going to form a connection that is going to turn us into a new single unit that will remain together. When that thing breaks how many people in divorce have told you, have expressed how that feels like the end of the world? Thermal nuclear explosion in their life. Everything is devastated, right? That's expensive. It's painful. If you can't share a house with your spouse anymore, then if we can't work together, one of us has to go. And whether you're the one now in the house by yourself or the one that's kicked out of it, that's devastating. You think about that bond matters. It's not about being the same. It's about staying connected. So, if I can't share space with you, you must either become the same or you must be destroyed. So I want to talk about this. Well, let's get into this. What does Jesus have to say about this? Because that's not, that doesn't sound like a happy ending. That doesn't sound like a good resolution. of Oh, you can't share space? Yeah, just split, and then you're done, and then that's it. That comes with a great cost. So then what does Jesus have to say about it? So I want to jump to Matthew 5. This is out of the Passion, and I love the Passion because it really helps. Uh, it's kind of like, to me, it kind of... Uh, uh, feels like there's similarities between the, uh, the Strong's Concordance, where it's like there's so many footnotes that helps kind of break open the meanings of these words and helps draw kind of a new, new wisdom from the same passages. So uh, your ancestors have also been taught, love your neighbors, uh, and in this case, neighbors in Aramaic can be translated as relatives, your brothers and sisters, your parents, your children. Love your relatives uh, and hate the ones who hate you. However, I say to you, love your enemy and bless the one who curses you. What? We've seen this over and over again. Love your enemies. Like, that sounds nice, but, but why? Like, why do we have to do this? Um, I say you love your enemy, bless the one who curses you. Do something wonderful for the one who hates you and respond to the very ones who persecute you by praying for them. For that will reveal your identity as children of your heavenly father. Well, that's interesting. So something about loving your enemies defines you as a child of God. Well, that, how, how, does that, how does that connect? I want to kind of think about it for a second. If I pray for those who, who, who persecute me, then it's very likely that my prayers for them will cause them to also be enlightened, to have revelation, to prosper. And hopefully in that process, maybe they agree with you. Maybe it even comes to the fact where if I pray for someone who's persecuting me, their life goes well, God moves in their life, and they learn, and they see the light, and they change, and then resolution happens because God worked it out because I prayed for them. Like, well, that's interesting. Maybe that could actually bring a resolution, is actually praying for the people who are persecuting me. And in that way, too, I'm demonstrating that I'm a child of God. That's interesting. God is kind to all by bringing the sunrise to warm and rainfall to refresh, whether a person does what is good or evil. 
what reward do you deserve if you only love the lovable? Don't even the tax collectors do that? And tax collectors in Hebrew can be swapped out as transgressors or the offenders. Um, how are you any different from others if you limit your kindness only to your friends? And I want to say there too, kindness can be replaced with asking peace of your brothers. So how are you different from others if you limit the asking of peace to your brothers? Instead, you only do it to your own friends, the people that you like. Because brothers doesn't necessarily mean people you like. Anyone have a brother or a sister that you don't always get along with? Like, I love you, but I don't like you all the time. Anyone know that relationship? How, what if you limit your kindness only to the people you like and not for the people you call family? Since you are children of a perfect father in heaven, become perfect. And perfect meaning whole, complete, mature, like him. So Jordan Peterson, uh, I love He's great. He's, he's so close to being a Christian. He's like right on the edge. And I was reading his book. And it was really interesting. So 12 Rules for Life, which I highly recommend. He is someone who knows the Bible inside and out. He believes in the person of Jesus, even believes that you can be saved through faith by Jesus. But it's funny. In interviews, he said, the only reason I, I'm not really a Christian yet is because I'm terrified of what might happen to me if I truly believed it if I really gave my full self over to it. But this man has broken apart and understood scripture better than I ever have. And he's not even necessarily 100% in his heart a believer yet. Although his mind has got him 99% of the way there, which is, is amazing. He's got a great story. But at the end of his first book, well, at the end of 12 Rules for Life, he, he talked about how he got a pen made of light. There's a little LED pen on the front of it, and it would illuminate his words as he was writing them. And he asked himself the question, what should I do with my newfound pen of light? Like, this could be a silly toy, or it could be something powerful. And he said, write the truth. And he thought to himself, I just heard something from myself, something that I knew, but I didn't know that I knew it. And on my end, I'm just thinking, he's just hearing from God. That's exactly what that is. So when I read the last part of his book, as he's writing out questions and letting himself answer, to me, what I believe he's doing is hearing from God and writing the truths of God as he is performing this exercise. And at one point he said, what shall I do with the stranger? Someone I don't know, someone I don't disagree with, someone who has not proven themselves safe. What do I do with a stranger? And he wrote, invite him into my house and treat him like a brother so that he may become one. I'm gonna read that again. What do I do with a stranger, with a foe? Invite him into my house and treat him like a brother so that he might become one. That is something called sacred hospitality. That through the power of God, I invite you into my home, even though we're different, even though we don't have trust and relationship. And maybe if I treat you like a brother, even with our differences, maybe one day you'll be a brother. And now who thinks too, you think about, well, you know, you're, you're inviting an enemy into your heart. It's like, well, maybe, but my question is this, is everybody that disagrees with you an enemy? No. Natalie and I disagree about stuff all the time. Natalie is not my enemy. She's my family. My parents and I disagree with about stuff all the time. But does that make us enemies? No. It makes us polar opposites sometimes. But we're still connected. We're still family. So when Jesus wanted to win the hearts and minds of a world that disagreed with him, because when Jesus came, he was bringing something fresh and new that everybody disagreed with, and he had to win over the entire world. That's a big task. That's difficult to do. But when he wanted to do that, how did he do it? He did it through family. He, his grand plan, his, powerful, his most powerful technique was family. He sent his son, a father sent his son to be a bridegroom, bride and groom, marriage of the church, to adopt brothers and sisters to his house, to sit before the father in his house. That's family. God's master plan was family from the very beginning. And that's when you think about, well, you know, he had, con he was different from the Pharisees, right? They had their tension and he was different from prostitutes and tax collectors or transgressors, offenders. They had their differences, but the difference is the Pharisees wanted to destroy him, but Jesus dined with the Pharisees and tax, or with the tax collectors and prostitutes. He was, the, the tax collectors and prostitutes, even though they were different, opposed, Jesus, what Jesus was preaching was different than how the prostitutes and tax collectors were living Yet Jesus said, I want to sit at your table. I want to treat you like family. 
And maybe someday, if I treat you like my brothers and sisters, maybe one day you'll be my brothers and sisters. That was his plan. It was not to, to pull up articles he found online that proved his opinion and disproved yours. It wasn't to reduce your argument down to a single point and then beat you over the head with it. It wasn't to judge and to criticize and to shame you until you agree with me because I just felt so terrible for my belief that I guess I'll take yours. Jesus said, no, come and sit with me. You can actually, even if you continue to disagree with me, you're still welcome here. If you can treat me like family, you don't even have to change. But I think that if you come in here, if you see and taste the goodness of what I'm bringing, I think you might. If I treat you like a brother, maybe someday you'll become one. I mean, what about marriage in its own? Marriage is two opposites bonded together by love and commitment. There's a family bond that unites the two poles together. And in that tension, that becomes the foundation of the whole family. From mom and dad come the kids and the grandkids and on and on. That's all the foundation that pulls it all together is the love and bond of family that connects two polar opposites. That's the atom. That's the building block of everything is living in this healthy tension. So the difference here, too, is that, again, the Pharisees, they wanted judgment. They wanted to say, you're different than me. We need to destroy you, silence you, kill you, push you out, disprove you. Whatever we have to do, we can't share space. So you have to go. Jesus, you have to be killed. We cannot allow you to stay here. We're just too different. When even the prostitutes and tax collectors said, we'll share space. We don't disagree. We don't agree on everything, but you're still kind to us. And we can coexist even in our brokenness. That is family. Family is a place where you can be different and still be accepted. It's a place where it's safe to make mistakes. It's a place where everyone can share their thoughts and ideas to a listening crowd who is willing to challenge or encourage you as needed. It's a place where everyone is looking out for you and truly wants your life to go well. It's a place where no matter how much your brother or sisters bother you, you still come back together at the end of the day and say, I still love you and that's what matters. When we choose to love our enemies, we create a space where we are different but I still treat you like family. You still matter to God and therefore you still matter to me. You are still welcome at my table. And if you disagree with me, then join me in the tension because it's in this tension that we will struggle and wrestle our way to the truth. We'll be refined in this, uh, this ongoing struggle, not as enemies, but as brothers and sisters working together, not against each other. I won't destroy you no matter how much you bother me. And I love you. Uh, and I think this is where the true wisdom of God is revealed. Because if I destroy my enemy, I have one less enemy. And that's the wisdom of the past that said, yeah, good, you now, you now you don't have any enemies. But then God, of course, always has a better truth, dimes for dollars. God says, I have a better idea. What if you love your enemies? You say, how does that work? Well, if I love my enemies, then he becomes my brother and he's no longer my enemy. So if I, love my, if I destroy my enemy, I have one less enemy. If I love my enemy, I have one less enemy and a brother. That's good math. That's real good math. That's a much better outcome. It's difficult, but then again, so is fighting. So if you're going to have to put an effort either way, why not do the one that gains you a brother, that expands your family, and that grows you personally instead of just destroying the people that disagree with you? So here we are in a nation that is more tense than ever. And the most destructive thing we can do right now is split the connection is to say, we can't share space anymore, so you have to be destroyed. I cannot tolerate you. If you don't like, if you think this, unfollow me, unfriend me. What, you haven't been vaccinated? You cannot come to my wedding. What is that? Like, you're not gonna wear a mask? Then get out of my home. You're not welcome here anymore. Hey, what, you think that, that, that Afghanistan was a good idea? I refuse to hear or listen to anything you will ever say again. That's nuclear nuclear destruction, because when we lose that connection, we become flying off the handle, radical people that don't know how to connect with the rest of the world. That's a problem. We have to be people who's willing to look at somebody that we disagree with, someone who bothers us, someone who has different thoughts and ideas, and say, hey, I know that we disagree on this, but let's talk about it. Join me in the tension. Share your perspective, because I have this feeling that if we talk about it and we can actually share the space and, talk and discuss it, find the truth as, as brothers, not as enemies, I think we may actually, like you actually might end up agreeing with me, but really, I might end up agreeing with you. And isn't that important too? And there's, so another thing that he wrote, Jordan Peterson, in the same, that same chapter, he says, what should I do with the enlightened one, the one who knows everything? And his answer, which from God, 
I believe it's from God. He believes it's through himself. What do I do with the enlightened one? He said, replace him with the true seeker of enlightenment. Isn't that the same thing? The enlightened one versus the seeker of enlightenment? They are not the same thing. There is no enlightened one. No man on earth, no woman on earth is enlightened. There is only the one who is seeking further enlightenment. Another word for the enlightened one is the know-it-all. I know everything. Everything I say and believe is true and factual, and you cannot prove me otherwise. That is ignorance. That is, pro- that is a problem. That is the pride before the fall right there. there. The world is always changing. God always has something to say. You always have room to grow. If you're refusing to listen, then you are assuming that no one else has anything good to give you, that God cannot provide you with any or improvement in your life. That is arrogance. That is pride. That is dangerous. So if we cannot be willing to step into that tension humbly, saying, maybe you know something that I don't. Let's talk about it then maybe you'll come onto my side or maybe I'll come onto your side or maybe we'll just always be in this perpetual struggle between the left and the right, hot and cold, black and white, light and dark. Maybe we'll never change. We're just gonna fight forever, but I would rather you fight at my table than you to be pushed out or destroyed or for you to come at me with guns and knives. I would rather us talk about this around a table than destroy each other or separate and go nuclear because that's not a good option. I would rather still call you a brother, even though that you look like an enemy, I want you to become family. Because enemy and family both disagree, but the enemy is seeking judgment and persecution. Family is seeking love and connection. I'm going to say that again, because that is probably the most important thing I've said today. (laughs) People who disagree with you can be an enemy or they can be family. And bo- an enemy disagrees with me and my family disagrees with me. The difference is that the enemy wants to persecute me and judge me. The family is still pursuing love and connection over disagreement, which means we can disagree and still stay connected. We can be a proton and an electron and be constantly buzzing and whipping and tension around each other, but we're still part of the same unit. And we can still build. We can still grow. We're still stable. That is what we're after. So I want to kind of bring this kind of home for a second. In a world right now between politics and COVID, masks or no masks, vaccines or no vaccines, what about the kids? What about the elderly? What about businesses? What about booster shots? I'm not going to say that there's a clear answer on this. But I am going to say that the only way we're going to make it through this thing is if we're able to talk about it without destroying each other. If we have to stay connected. And if only one side is heard, whichever side that may be, that's a bad idea. And there will be a lot of unnecessary suffering that comes with only one side being heard. A lot of people have been saying that this has always been an ongoing struggle between safety and freedom. Is safety important? Yes. Is freedom important? Yes. But what's the balance? 100% safety is a bad idea. And 100% freedom is a bad idea. We have to be able to discuss health in a healthy way. Like family, what is the right thing? We must respectfully discern the best course from within this healthy tension of an open and honest search for the truth. And one last thing here, Jordan Peterson also discussed, and I love this question, what shall I do with a torn nation? That's an important question. His answer, stitch it back together with careful words of truth. If anything has become clear over the past few years, we are dividing and polarizing and drifting towards chaos. It is necessary under such conditions, if we are to avoid catastrophe, for each of us to bring forward the truth as we see it. Not the arguments that justify our ideologies, not just the answers we're comfortable with, not the machinations that further our ambitions, I have something to gain from this perspective, but the stark, pure facts of our existence revealed for others to see and contemplate so that we might find common ground and proceed together. We're a church body that believes a lot of different things. And I've said this before, too, that we're a church that there are a wild amount of differences within our church body, but there's more that connects us than there is that, that divides us. And I don't care what you believe about anything, you are welcome here. This is family life, baby. What is more family than inviting people in to do peaceful combat with, to live in tension with, to discuss things in a way that is designed for mutual edification and encouragement. This is where we get refined. There's even a song from Frozen, of all things. Now that I watch that three times a day with my daughter, 
the little trolls sing a song about how Kristoff's a fixer-upper. He said, uh, he's a bit of a fixer-upper. That's what it's all about. Uh, father, sister, brother, we need each other to build us up and round us out. How important is that? Frozen knows this, yeah. all right? We need each other because as we do that tension, we become either sharpened on where we need to be sharp or we become smooth where we need to be smooth. And it's in that knocking together that we're all going to take the shape that God is calling for us. That's how we fulfill our highest calling in Christ is through family. So as we live in this world right now, we can be polar opposites and still be united. And family is the model for that. Love and grace and safety and connection over disagreement. That is family life. That is how we are going to get through this world together. So I have a challenge for you. Uh, I remember reading when couples were on the brink of divorce, they were encouraged to find five things every day that they are grateful for in the other person, which is, oh, man, talk about love your enemy. You know, if you're, if you're on bad terms with someone, every day I have to say five things that I love about you, yeah, love your enemy. And in that way, not only are you, are you pa- like pacifying your foe, calming their anger, you're actually gaining them back to you. You're loving your enemy. You're doing the good math. You have one fewer enemy and one more family member. That's good math. So try this with people you disagree with. Family, marriage, work, politics, religion, whatever. Anybody that you feel tension with, feel comfortable in the tension. And to anyone who feels estranged or hostile, invite them to eat at your table. Invite them into the tension. And it's going to be uncomfortable, but so is destruction. (laughs) So get uncomfortable. Pursue the truth together in a respectful way. Um, yeah, that's it. So I want to challenge us all today. <laughs> that's it. The end. Uh, really stuck the landing there. So. <laughs>